Tonight is a chance for friends and fans to celebrate the writing career of John Wells, who is the 2007 recipient of the Writers Guild of America Patty Chayefsky Laurel Award for Television. That award is a Career Achievement Award, and it's the highest honor the Guild can give a television writer. We decided that as much as possible, we wanted to celebrate the Laurel winners with more than just a plaque at the awards dinner because careers such as John's are truly remarkable achievements. So uh, our moderator for this, for this casual, not a formal stuffy tribute, but a, but a casual and I hope um, uh, warm celebration of John's career followed again by champagne and, and uh, uh, coffee in the lobby. Uh, will be moderated by uh, Brad Whitford, the drummer for Aerosmith. No. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. This is Bradley Whitford, the Emmy Award winning actor who played Josh Lyman on the West Wing, and that does make a lot more sense. Bradley, please come up. Now, I'm sure everyone knows here that writing is hard. There are so many qualities about John and his work and his life that I find admirable. But there is one quality that I find irritating. He makes it look so easy. John Wells, please come up and join Brad on the stage. I, I, because I'm in a union-affiliated thing, I need to confess that uh, he's actually the guitarist, Brad, Brad Whitford. And when I was in New York uh, and not working a lot, um, I got a residual. for, uh, I think it was $428 to, and his name is actually Bradley Whitford, and I, I cashed it. <laughs> so I owe him some money. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I, uh, John has been a, a huge part of uh, my uh, creative um, life, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here for that. One thing that, that, that you were commenting upon is how, um, how easy uh, John seems to make it look in a town of people who are uh, colorful, flipping out, uh, irresponsible, self-obsessed. Um, uh, I have never seen, uh, through some pretty crazy shooting times and writing times, I've never seen you waver. I've, been flopping around on the deck like the other fish, but you were always uh, very calm. And I and I and I re I, I really want to know this um, about you. And I know you in your personal life and in your marriage and as a father and everything. Is that genetic or tactical? Is 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 there is there is um, is it something that uh, is a way you you approach the business? Is it the way you've always approached writing, I mean, I think the difficulty of writing often makes us think that uh, a more desperate uh, uh, expression uh, <laughs> will surround the writing. So just talk about that a little. Well, I, I should first say that, that uh, Brad and I began working really together in probably the best episode of ER that I think we ever did, which was uh, <coughs> Love's Labor's Lost, um, which he played the father of... Uh, a, a woman who's, uh, who died in childbirth and, uh, and is also a wonderful writer, for those of you who don't know, wrote on West Wing. So the flopping he's talking about had to do in the writer's room <laughs> primarily, I think. Um, <clears throat> it was trial and error. Uh, I discovered that panic was not a particularly useful tool. And it was one more way, because I was always looking for ways to try and not write, 
that it was one more way that uh, I could not write. I, I now just kind of try to contain the panic of, uh, it, you know, it's that you, you have about a minute and a half to two minutes after you finish writing a scene when it's still good. Right. Um, <laughs> And then that inevitable thing, way, you know, the wave comes over you, maybe you ought to read it one more time. And then the, it really sucks and I have to start completely over, happens next. And, I, and I've just learned to kind of work my way through all of my, uh, my terror. And have you, um, you mentioned before that, that you'd had kind of a break and been able to have some, some downtime. And you mentioned that, th that part of that downtime was, was still writing. I mean, do, are, 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 is, is it something that uh, if, if you don't write uh, consistently, your fingers start to itch like a guitar player? <laughs> no, it's not so much that. It's, it's, um, I'm convinced that if I stop writing for any extended period of time, I'll never get up the courage to write again. Um, so I'm, I have found in those few periods when I've not written for an extended period of time, six or eight weeks, that, um, that I find it can take me several months to get back into the rhythm of writing. So and is, I try to do it just like practice, just to try and stay in the space. Right. And, and, and is part of your attraction to series television the, um, the, the season of it all, the, the at-bats of it, of, of it all? Well, the, my, the major attraction to me was after, when I was first starting to write, I went to USC and I came out and I, I spent a number of years just writing in my, uh, in my you know, underwear. Mm -hmm. uh, in the house, and um, the attraction of it was actually seeing something get done, uh, right. and and actually finishing something and then seeing it being produced quickly and getting to learn from the experience of actually seeing those dailies right away right. was an extraordinary sort of eye-opening experience for me. Um, and again, I will if if I don't have a deadline, I can take a very long time to do something. So um, the deadline and it has to be an, an externally imposed deadline, and an internally imposed deadline won't work. No, yeah, my internally imposed deadlines are useless. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know about everybody else, but uh, they're not worth a whole lot. But uh, the external deadlines really help me, and and um, and so I started to set up sort of benchmarks for myself, things I wasn't didn't want to do that I'd seen other people do. I mean, you know, one of the like things. What? Well, one of the things that I that I that I'm very proud of is that we. I try very hard on the shows that, that I'm working on to, to have scripts that are prepared and in the second or third draft by the first day of prep. And, and I take a great deal of pride in that just because I think it allows everybody else that you're working with to have the time to really do their job or do their, do their best work. Um, and so that kind of an external deadline really helps me because now I've done it for so long that I you know, will feel really humiliated if I start missing some. <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> but uh, but it's sacrosanct that you, that a director goes into prep with a with a script. Yeah, I I prefer to have directors go into a script with a second or third draft. Right, I think that that's because then the actors. I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot in the past, and the actors actually have an opportunity relatively early in the prep process to read the script uh, and to make comments on it, or at least start to think about it. Complaints, um, uh, su suggestions about things that won't work. <laughs> right. But it happen But then it happens um, before you're actually on stage trying to do it. Right. I. I. I just a, an observation from my point of view, and one thing that I, that uh, part of what you're talking about um, uh, that I felt was a virtue uh, uh, at the West Wing was that everybody's nightmare is uh, commercially centric writing, uh, and we're thrilled when we get writer centric writing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it should be story-centric writing, <laughs> um, and uh, making sure that everybody has a chance to to uh, collaborate. Now, what what do you start with um, uh, are, are, when you're looking for material? Now, are you trying to um, grab a onto the zeitgeist? Are you just looking for a good story? Um, uh, what sort of arenas? Um, uh, are, are you trying to expand the arenas you're working in? Are you trying to refine uh, what you've done? Are you trying to switch genres? Or is it purely intuitive? It's mostly intuitive. I, I've never been able to, any time that I've attempted to figure out what the zeitgeist was and then get to it, I, I think that's like trying to determine what's going to be commercial. Right. Um, and that's, I've failed every single time I've tried to do it. And I've, I've really only been successful doing things that other people um, told me were not going to be successful. 
Um, not that it, not that that challenged me and that I thought I was really smart and I'd just keep trying to do it, but that gave me a sense that it wasn't out there. And so there was maybe a possibility to do something that people weren't seeing. But I'm mostly character-centric. Right. I try to find um, a character or a little piece of something that I'm interested in writing about. And then see if there's a, for, for broadcast television, to see if there's a genre that it fits into so that the people that you're you know, going to take it to and sell and have to present it to the public have a way of, of selling it. Right. But I'm only interested really in the characters. And if I can't kind of figure out the characters that I'm interested in writing about, for a long time, because you're really talking about doing a hundred or, you know, in the case of VR now, 300 and it'll Please. end up being 300 and some odd chapters in these little weekly books, these little penny dreadfuls that we do, you right. know, every week. And so, um, so I'm looking for something in a character. It, the, the difficulty for me now um, is I really, it's not that I don't want to repeat myself in the sense that I'm, have, uh, that I feel I need to create new challenges for myself, but I've written a great deal, and, and I have to guard against writing the same thing again. Um, right. I actually will oftentimes write something and take it to some of the people that I work with all the time and say, this felt a little familiar when I was writing it, and did it remind you of something that I wrote before, a scene that I wrote before? And uh, sometimes people say no, and sometimes they tell me exactly what episode it was, and I'll go back, and it's <laughs> it goes back kind of up. word for word, and I said, boy, I thought that did come a little easy, didn't it? <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it is the danger of, you know, I've, um, written over a hundred episodes myself and, and supervised or, <clears throat> you know, given extensive notes on another 600 or so. So, you know, you do start, <clears throat> you do start to, there's a rhythm to the writing, particularly in broadcast television, of the act breaks and how they have to fall into those right. act breaks where you, everybody develops their tricks and it's trying not to continue to fall back in those tricks. What's the most, um, the most common uh, is, is, there, is there a common flaw that comes up over and over again in these writers' meetings when, when you get a one-hour script? Uh, is the, is, or is there, a, um, is there an act break issue? Is there something that consistently comes up? I think depending on the individual writer and what their background is, there are sort of specific things for who people have been or what they've done or what they've come for. Um, There'll oftentimes be a lot of scene work where people who actually come out of the theater in particular will write really wonderful scenes and yet linked together they don't add up to a progression for the character in some way that's interesting. Right. Um, and so there'll be a very good scene and a very good scene. And that's very difficult in episodic television because of the pressures that the actors are under every day and the amount of material that you're doing. It's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> And the pressure that you're under to not actually just, you know, to perf the, the real discipline, I think, on stage is to make sure that you're not just performing that scene, but have a complete understanding of what else has to happen for the character in that episode. Right. And that can happen. And so a lot of people that come out of the theater, um, whether they, they have acted a lot or directed a lot, uh, will have that as something that you have to watch out for. Right. They, 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 won't, they won't have the sense of the urgency of the, of the structure. The building of it, that there's actually an arc that has to happen over the whole thing. And, and it's very difficult to give notes on because the individual scene works. And right. So you'll go from scene to scene and the, the individual scene actually works and the, and the material in the scene works. And yet you have to kind of talk about, well, I know that it, it's working. Right. But you actually have to simplified in some way so we have more places to go and the character has more places to go. Now, uh, how do you deal with, not from people who, who, who work for you or who, who you're asking for input, but um, how, do you, how do you deal with um, uh, network in, in network notes and, and, and how does it feel emotionally? I, I feel like if I'm completely honest, whenever any director has ever said anything to me, <laughs> you, you know this, I go through three silent beats, which, you know, and I apologize to your mom, but uh, you know, fuck you, uh, I stink, uh, okay, what? <laughs> Um, and, and if you look around, you know, different actors live at different houses on that street, <laughs> one of the three. Um, but, but are you, uh, have you had to discipline yourself? Um, are, you, are, are you grateful for notes? Uh, oh, are, 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 if somebody gives you an idiotic note, is it still a flag to you that something might be off? Yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, as a writer, when I finish something, the only note I really want to get is you're a living God. And, and, <laughs> and really everything <laughs> short of that is, you know, any, any sentence that then it has a but on it or anything is right. just, you know. That's tragic. why I drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I try to look at, at notes for what they flag not with not the solutions that are presented, mm -hmm. and a lot of the time the difficulty with the um, with current executives at the networks and the studios, <clears throat> and it's not true of everybody, but is they're trying to provide you with the solution, and what's most helpful is to just hear what the problem is, mm -hmm. because the sometimes the solutions are helpful and they give you some sort of idea. Or you may say, oh well, that's that's not what I want to do, but I had thought about that when I was writing. Maybe I want to do this. But, the, but more often than not, it's a solution that kind of you get lost in right. for a while, trying to kind of figure out what it is. And what you really want to know is what's not working in the script or in the scene for that person. Now, are, are, do you, have you noticed uh, in the time, you, in the arc of your career, um, uh, a uh, disintegration in the, in, in the um, integrity of those notes? <laughs> or, or are they getting better and better? Um. <laughs> It's no, no, but is, the, is, the, is, is there more, um, no, uh, no, is there more commercial pressure that, 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 is, that is bending that exchange? Well, I think that one thing that has happened, which, which is problematic, <clears throat> is that since the res, uh, rescinding of the FinCEN rules, the financial syndication rules about 10, 11 years ago, the, prom the, the kind of the tobacco company CEO promises in Congress that, no, of course, we weren't going to end up owning all of our own programming isn't really true. And uh, the individual networks are providing a great deal of their material to the, from their in-house studio for fully vertically integrated companies. And what's happened as part of that is that the studio executives are, gen the, the, the genuine kind of career path is you come up through the studio ranks and you get moved to the network. And so the studio uh, notes are oftentimes not particularly uh, helpful because they're just trying to appease what's coming from the network. The, the older systems, one of the reasons why I, I continue to enjoy working at Warner Brothers is that, that that step in between the studio and the network I find to be a very helpful one mm. because the studio can actually be an advocate for you. That's not to say that the studio is not always an advocate for you um, or is, is in sometimes an advocate for you, but that I think Offer, what's happened is that, it, yeah. Yeah, that, that everybody's been increasingly empowered in the situation um, and there is less respect, I think, for, uh, for everyone who's doing it. There's, it it's, an, it's an odd thing. I mean, it, I get um, sort of have the, a version of the, uh, of the jungle drums, which is email now from all the other writers that you've worked with for all these years. And, um, and the amount of time that people are spending uh, on shows taking notes has dramatically increased. Uh, and, and that's not good because it's taking away from the time that you need to do the things that you're supposed to be doing. Right. Writing in particular, but also um, a lot of times those notes aren't particularly well filtered. It's actually easier for me to take notes now than it was when I began because I'm... You have calluses. <laughs> I have calluses and I'm a lot more familiar with kind of making my way through it so I'm not as threatened. I think when you're, when you're younger the notes can be... You, you, when you don't have as much experience, I don't think right. it's a matter of age so much as the experience or how much you've done it. Um, you, you take them all in. You know, it's like reading bad reviews, you know, you really shouldn't, but you do anyway, you just can't help yourself. And, right. uh, and it slows you down. Yes. <laughs> uh, so wh what, would you, you, what would your advice to, uh, to, to a young, r uh, is, is it just a question of, of balance? Uh, um, I remember go when I was uh, going through the, um, the meetings in the writers' room, that there was, I, I, I just didn't know when I, if I should be holding on to something I felt uh, strongly about, or if the committee was going to, uh, um, if it was going to become an, you know, another story that went away. I mean, how do you want the writers in uh, your room to deal productively with input without sort of losing them. So without just rolling over. Without just <laughs> rolling. <laughs> just tell me what to do. <laughs> just tell me what to do. Um, but, well, part of the the job that I think a good writing uh, executive producer has to do is to make certain that <clears throat> that all the writers who are working for them feel as if their contribution is valued. 
I mean, it, it's so much work to do 22 or 24 or 26 episodes of anything during the course of a year that you need <clears throat> the talents of everybody who's there and you're paying people quite a bit of money and you, you want to get everything out of mm -hmm. them. And I think that's best achieved by encouraging people's ideas, listening to what they have to say and trying not to allow the room to turn into a, um, you know, to get uh, where there's a lot of back backstabbing and and unpleasantness and, and, and try and keep it to where everybody's focused on what can be better. You know, there's, nobody's wrong in what they bring into a writer's room. It's what the writer's idea is and, and what they're trying to do. So you're looking for ways to be supportive and, and you know, I, I'm very much of the, of the belief that if you're doing your job well as an executive producer, you're not rewriting people very much that you're really trying to keep it to a minimum so that everybody feels supported and like their work's going to get there. Sometimes that can be more work. It, it can feel a lot easier to just say, you know what, I'll just take it and redo it than to go through the whole process. But you're trying to get everybody to understand what it is you want. And you want to encourage them in that and to feel as if they're really contributing. And that, and that requires a, a deft balance of, of trying to get what you want, but also not, you know, killing the the creative interests and, and artistic merits of the individual writers that you're working for. And, and I think that's true of directors and, and actors and everybody else you're working with. Right. Um, was there a moment, was, uh, was, it on, was it on China Beach where your responsibilities radically increased, where, where you went from? Well, China Beach was an extraordinary experience. I'm, I'm still working and love many of the people that I worked with on China Beach and a lot of the ER crew is still some, some of the people from China Beach and what happened was it was a show that's actually oftentimes the best kind of show to be on. It was one that nobody thought would work and the, uh, John Young uh, and Bill Broyles who's now a wonderful and accomplished um, uh, screenwriter had created and um, I remember actually when it was first shown to me at, at Warner Brothers by one of the executives they said here's something for the next meeting of our literary society and uh, told me I could read it, and of course, having heard that, I desperately wanted to be on it immediately. <laughs> right. And, um, it, but what happened on the show is we had so much, there was sort of no, um, the, the network was not giving us a tremendous amount of supervision, and so we were able as a writing staff to sit down and throw out a lot of different ideas and do all different kinds of things, fool around with the narrative, move back and forth in time, um, deal with very um, weighty issues that weren't being dealt with a whole lot at that time on television. And, and it was a great experience. And then really the best thing that happened for me creatively on it was that in the final year of the series, they moved us to Saturday night and told us we weren't coming back and to just go have fun. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, we told a lot of strange stories. Some of them worked, some of them didn't, but we got to fool around with all different kinds of things. And um, Now, yeah. you've been through all kinds of experiences. When it, when it, sh it, 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 it does... Um, when, when ER explodes right out of the gate. Um, that's a good experience. That's yeah. a good one. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> um, do, uh, does network, uh, uh, does outs, is it, a, is it a protection game uh, from the network or do they back off and think this is working as opposed uh, to a situation with a show that is struggling? Well, th these things are all relative on kind of a day-to-day -day and a week-to-week -week basis. Um, when the show first took off, the network had been trying to get us to change it substantially because they didn't think it was working. And so there was a really cool period where Warren Littlefield called me one morning about eight, uh, 7.30 in the morning on a Friday morning and said, I just saw last night's ratings and forget everything I've said for the last month and a half. <laughs> <coughs> And that was great, but it, it didn't last like for seven years or anything. It, 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 you know, it lasted for, I don't know, a month and a half or something, and that was really swell. Um, the, the panic and the concern about protecting these kinds of um, hit shows actually can increase and get worse as time goes on. The, the most difficult part about it is, I think, controlling, uh, or not controlling, but trying to temper everybody's expectations for what's going to happen to their own individual career in their own life. Because you're still, what kind of got you there was doing the show and trying to do it well. And I, I started to refer to it as uh, the world sort of at the other end of the telephone. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we were getting phone calls from Newsweek about setting up the cover photo shoot and everything. And you're still trying to figure out what you're, how you're going to make Thursday work. Right. You know, so right. you're, you're trying to manage that so that everybody keeps their feet on the ground. But it's very difficult, uh, particularly very difficult for the cast because their life changes so dramatically in that 
you know, relatively short period of time. And right. we, we, we certainly went through it on West Wing, too. Now, d d d did you feel, um, I know that, that your life doesn't change in the way of, of uh, uh, an, an actor's does, but did you feel being in charge of that, um, what continues to be a, a, a very uh, commercially powerful show, did, did, did it, did it, did it change? Uh, did it make you feel self-conscious in any way? Did you feel over-interpreted? Did, 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 were you at all ambivalent about, about um, aside from all the good stuff that comes with it, uh, of, of the changes in your profile? Well, the, the danger was really that, uh, from the writing of the show, that you would start to try and figure out what made it a success and analyze it in some fashion and come up with a 10-point you know, plan of what made a successful ER episode. Um, and so we actually sort of went the other way, which is why I probably didn't get seven years of peace from the network, but only a couple of months, was we, we tried to expand on what it was we were doing. Because um, I was very concerned that we were going to lose track of, and I, I was concerned that I was going to lose track of what we were trying to do in the first place. It was actually easier to write during the summertime before it became a success right. than it was when we were getting you know, there was a period when we were getting f 40 and 45 shares and, um, you know, 40 million viewers. And so, you know, you, you get to that point where you sit down at your computer and you think, gee, I wonder what I'm going to write that 40 billion people want to watch. And the answer is absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> no idea what I'm going to write. So you have right. to kind of try to get back to it. And the, it, the nice thing for being a writer when that happens is that your profile doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't increase. You can still go out to dinner and you can still go to the movies and, it was years before, um, you know, people started giving me scripts at the AMC in Santa Monica and stuff like that. But, <laughs> but, um, um, so, but, but what you're watching is all the other people that you're working with and how quickly that, you know, profile changes for them. Right. You know, and, and trying to... And you don't want the show to get trapped in the mannerism that got it, in yeah. a mannerism of what got it there, but in the original sort of impulse. Of yeah, it. and particularly for ER, because it was, for all intents and purposes, we were trying at the time to shoot a documentary look at what happens in an emergency room and keep it very gritty, and, and the lighting was done in such a way so as people didn't look their best. And, you know, and, and there were suddenly requests for people to appear on magazine covers and, you know, could we, th you know, some of the actresses started coming to the set looking very, very good <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, wanting to wear, you know, and sort of asking if we could take the scrubs in a little tighter around the, oh, wow. you know, and all that kind of stuff. So That's a uh, rough call for an agent <laughs> to have today. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it was trying to, it was trying to maintain that. Are there hot scrubs? Um, we discovered over many years there are not hot scrubs. We, we, there were actually um, clandestine attempts uh, oh, to discover wow. this, and uh, nobody looks good in scrubs. It just doesn't happen. Um, uh, but it sounds like uh, whether, whether a sh uh, that one of the things you're constantly trying to do is expand the net of what the show um, can encompass. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very tricky because... The, the network and everybody who's involved with it wants you to do a whole bunch of the same thing a lot more and to have it just be as successful. Right. But um, it has to keep growing creatively for the people who are doing it. I mean, you know, a, a perfect example of that is that um, George and, and Tony wanted to do the live show and, the, and they had presented it for a couple of years and I couldn't really figure out how to do it. And, and uh, one day Carol Flint came in and said, uh, I, I know how to do that. And so I said, I saw you out here somewhere. You're, are you out here, Carol? I thought I saw her. Oh, there you are. And I said, well, God bless, you know. <laughs> I hope it goes well. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I still didn't have any idea how to do it. But it, it was something that in the doing of it, I'm not sure if it was um, for the audience, you know, they kind of tuned in and expecting it to be particularly different, and it wasn't that different really from an episode. But for the shooting company, the experience of actually doing it, the excitement that came with it, the additional challenges of doing it, um, took us through two more years right. of just excitement about the job, excitement about what you're doing. Because inevitably, in a successful show, the initial um, excitement of it, the, the, you know, the kind of grabbing onto that zeitgeist and all the magazine covers and the, the th the, all of the excitement of it, um, begins to dissipate. That's just the nature of pop culture. Right. 
and you want to still be making a show that you really care about. So you've got to keep expanding it as you go and challenging yourself. Is it a is it a is it <laughs> is it a clear moment when uh, when you feel like uh, uh, you don't know how to write for a character anymore after a, a number of years, or how do you how do you differentiate that from just block? Um, I have about four years in me, usually on a show before I need to step away. There usually will be a couple of characters that I'm still very interested in writing for, and other characters that I've just kind of they've become a little stale for me. Um, and that's having nothing to do with what the uh, how, what the actor's doing. You know, some characters are are crafted initially in ways that are more compelling to write for for who you are. One of the things that a writing staff is great for is to try and bring in people who are di interested in different characters than you are and have very different backgrounds than you have. Rather than looking for people who are like you, I'm always looking for people who have something else they want to do. And I'll often ask people after a pilot, what's your favorite character? I'm trying to find people who are interested in characters oftentimes that I'm not exactly sure what to do with. Um, and, and that enlivens that whole thing because there are other people. But I hit it about four years. That's when I start going around saying, have I written this scene before? And the answer starts to be yes a lot. And uh, Then it's time to go. <laughs> I can ask one more question, and then we're going to take uh, a question from the audience. But um, uh, it, it, you, uh, m you make an effort to uh, go into a season with some sense of, w of what the arc is, is going to be. You get your writers together and do that. Uh, uh, why do you do that? How rigidly do you hang on to it? Why is that important to you? Well, the kinds of shows that I've been involved with primarily are, are basically serialized shows with some kind of a franchise that's involved. And, and I'm always more interested in the serialized elements than I'm in the franchise elements. I mean, I know we have to service the franchise elements, whatever the, the patient is coming through the door, whatever the political crisis is, or on a cop show, what the case is going to be. <clears throat> but the um, but I'm interested in the characters, so we, I like to try and uh, get everybody together, you know, usually around Memorial Day on the show and spend four and five days away from the writer's room, away from where we normally work, and dissect all of the work from the year before, which can be kind of a brutal process because we get to anonymously on cards kind of pick on each other's material and say what we liked and didn't like about the last year. Oh. And, and usually, interestingly, <laughs> you, were, you were never on those cards. Sure. Right? Um, <laughs> The um, uh, usually a consensus, a certain kind of consensus, starts to evolve about what we're proud of. A lot of times, it's just we did that a lot, and let's not do it again for a little while, or that we are starting to fall on, <coughs> fall back on the same sort of dramatic tricks, which are great at the beginning and start to be very repetitive by the time you've done it a lot. Um, and so we we really sort of break the whole show apart and then start to pitch ideas and pitch ideas about character and things that could happen to the characters, who they are, what they could go through, what we're interested in. There's a lot of research that goes into that. And then we go back into the writer's room and spend four weeks, you know, three to five weeks, depending on the show, starting to put some of those ideas up on, a, on dry race boards for the whole season. Okay. But they... Oh, a lot of times it ends up being exactly what you thought it was going to be, but other times it, it changes dramatically based on who the actor is that you get for a part. Like, you know, there was a wonderful thing the writers worked out this year on ER, which was worked out for Andre Brower, and then he couldn't do it, and, and then Forrest Whitaker became available to do it. And so it changed, you know, what it was changed quite a bit based on just how different the quality that the actor brings to it. Right. So you want to remain flexible enough um, you know, for all those things. And, and sometimes things happen, you write a, what you think is a great character, and it may be great on the page, and it gets cast, and there's, you know, a romantic uh, element to it, and there's no chemistry between the two actors. And then you're just sort of forcing it, and you watch the people are getting more and more uncomfortable, and, you know. <laughs> it's been there. <laughs> and you need, to, you need to be flexible enough to ditch out on things before you, you die. Okay. Uh, a question uh, from the audience. I have a list here. I think our first question is from a Mr. Sheen, <laughs> the acting president. Yes, yes, thanks so much, Brett. Uh, 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 Mr. Wells, uh, I have an unrelated uh, question to ask you. First of all, I when I realized you were here this evening, I thought, well, he's not in Hawaii. And uh, I assume that your vacation house there is empty. And, you know, I haven't worked for a while, and I was looking forward to a few days off. I was just wondering if uh, uh, you would uh, consider uh, our, our staying there for the summer. And, 
uh, that aside, I, I had an idea about a, a new series. Uh, uh, give it some thought. Don't, don't, don't make up your mind straight away. But uh, I thought about this idea about a, a former acting president of the United States. And, I, and I, I thought, well, maybe you couldn't remember. I bought an 8 by 10 I'll leave with your assistant just in case. <laughs> because you never know about these things, you know. Uh, there are, a, a, there are a, a number of extraordinary people who are waiting behind me to come honor you and congratulate you on this award and on what you have meant in their lives. They've come to give uh, gratitude and praise, and deservedly so. Uh, and I've come here for, for that reason as well. Uh, whenever I am asked what kind of guy John Wells is, and that was a lot over the years that, that I spent on the West Wing, seven of the best years of my life, both professionally and privately, I, I always said uh, uh, things that were deeply personal and um, heartfelt. And they were shared by uh, all of the members of the cast, not just the cast, but the production crew and, uh, and the, uh, uh, all the people who were a, a part of the West Wing family. And it was truly a family. Um, I've been in this business for 48 years. <laughs> I say fly, not 48 years old, of course, <laughs> but never mind that. Uh, I started in 1959 and with the Living Theater in New York uh, uh, doing a little uh, uh, Breck play for $5 a week. Now, mind you, I was worth every penny at that time, but it was non-union. But that was the start of my career. So I've worked for a lot of producers over the years. I've never worked for a better man, a better human being, a more intelligent producer, a, a man with great compassion and humanity. And uh, when Brad invited me here this night, I thought, what could I say that I haven't said? Well, many of the things I'm saying now are the first time I've said them publicly. But I'm here representing John Spencer tonight, because I know he would want to come here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, many of you, many of you do not know what I'm going to tell you just now, uh, except uh, Brad. Uh, John, uh, uh, before his a year and a half before his death, uh, had a, 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 a medical emergency uh, that he kept completely quiet because uh, the worst thing for an actor is to get ill, uh, because you're afraid, particularly when you get up to be our age, that uh, you you won't work because the insurance will not cover you. And so that was his greatest fear. John had a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a tumor on his lung, and he was going out to the Midwest to have it looked after. He didn't want any of us to come and visit him because we would attract attention. He was in a crisis, and he didn't want John to know because he was afraid that maybe John would write him out of the series. This was the start of our sixth year. And I pleaded with John to tell uh, 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 j this John what was happening to be even and direct. Um, he thought of asking Brad to say that he was having a facelift out there, but <laughs> no one goes to Lexington, Kentucky for a facelift, so th <laughs> that was out of the question. And I uh, love John, but his face looked like a, 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 a catcher's mitt. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, John Spencer called John Wells and was assured he would never, ever, ever write him off the show, that whenever he was well enough to come back, he was welcome. He did that. And... I, I just want to personally say, as, as, because I thought of John as my brother, John and I were like the parents of the West Wing uh, crew. We were the oldest. Uh, grandparents. Uh, grandparents. Now. <laughs> <laughs> John and I always felt that if we ever fell down, the rest of them would just walk over us. <laughs> uh, so just keep standing there and don't take any nonsense. Uh, uh, but uh, he was eternally grateful to this man. And John, told, John Spencer told me personally he never worked for a more compassionate, more understanding, more humane producer than John Wells. And I just want to thank you for what you did for him and for me. God bless. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. How are you? <laughs> How are you, John? I'm real good. Thanks so much. Thank and you can use the house anytime you want. I'm Mike. Okay. I get a chair. Oh, there's a chair. And uh, another question from Carol Flint. Oh, no, I made a mistake. Yeah, Carol, get up here. Some order thing. Where are we going to go? Here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, man. I just keep it. Yes, hello, John. Uh, is this. It doesn't, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay. Well, I have a very simple question to ask John, and yes, surprise, this is the format of the evening, but... <laughs> it's a roast. Nobody told me. <laughs> 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 well, You'd think somebody would bring that up before they asked <laughs> you to do it. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't really call it a roast. I think you should think of it more as an intervention. 
<laughs> and we're all here to help usher you into the next phase of your career where there just may be some things that need to be cleared up and you know brought out in the open and discussed. Um, and then that's where I have a very simple, simple question. Is it true, John, that you invented the dry erase board? <laughs> yes or no? Uh, no. See, he didn't really invent it. The reason why so many of you associate John Wells with the dry erase board is because a lot of us who have worked with him know that this very primary television writer's tool, the dry erase board, which it's interesting, it's like arguably the place, it's now the implement that you stare at more than you do your computer. And um, John is really legendary because it isn't much publicized, but tonight I'd like to begin to um, explore some of the elements of the John Wells method of dry erase board, story breaking, and staff writing building. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping that eventually there will be a website. But if you're working on a John Wells show, the first thing that happens when the staff comes together after that retreat that was discussed, which is you know, mostly about the staff getting together and looking at each other's knees and Bermuda shorts and bathing suits. But you get together for the first time in the room with John and you walk in and on two or maybe three walls are these huge humongous dry erase boards. They look bigger than the screen behind him. <laughs> and a lot's been said, um, written, explored about the writer facing the empty page. But I gotta tell you, John really understands that that empty page is minuscule compared to those huge dry erase boards staring at you. And when John comes in, the leader that he is, he walks up to that board. He's courageous, you know? He walks up to that big, frightening, ex infinite expanse, and he writes number one in the upper left-hand corner. Then he draws a line under number one. It extends for 11.3 inches <laughs> before he moves next over and writes number two and draws a line under it. The line is written in black. And by the time he's gone down the board, maybe if it's a particularly fearless time, he goes over to the next one and he writes, you know, seven through 12. But when he's finished, there are columns for each of those first episodes. And the horrible, indescribable task ahead is suddenly, brilliantly, been designated to these columns. And then the writers begin to understand that this is their shared concern. All the episodes are the same size. Everybody's going to write, can write things underneath these different columns. And it really can be um, addressed. This amount of work can be addressed in this way. And I think it's one of John's many great gifts that he really finds a way to start to order the chaos because the chaos is just always right there behind those boards. I mean, those boards become kind of our cave walls that protect the clan of the writers and the etchings on them are really the only thing that stand between us and um, you know the horrible, you know, create the, the, the fear of what could destroy our creative juices. Now I can't go on and on, I can't tell you everything about the John Wells method, but there are a couple frequently asked questions that I do want to address about the, about the board and what it is. One of the questions people will ask is John's a very, you know, a big and capable presence and very talented, does he monopolize the board? And the answer is he does not. Every single writer from staff writer up to executive producer can step up to that board. Well, every writer who writes really legibly. <laughs> well, every writer whose penmanship was A plus in the third grade and can keep straight the rather Byzantine color-coded character um, <laughs> designations is welcome to step up to the board and and if you are a writer who kind of gets excited in the thrill of a new idea and you might tend to write uphill or something like that you might be asked to step back from the board and let somebody else <laughs> write on the board but aside from that it's very very democratic process and uh, <laughs> The final
final step of the board, because we really do have to skip ahead, although people will ask, are there other writers, executive producers, methods of dry erase board that are equally um, effective? The answer is no. Those of us who have worked with John are deeply scarred and branded for life. It is so dispiriting and sorrow-inducing for us to be in a room where there are dry erase boards which are abused, used willy-nilly, big ideas, little ideas, tidbits from research, all scrambled together on a board to be erased when it's full. It's so sad. And we, we are incapable of working that way after we have worked with John and his organizational method that really is all about nurturing creativity. The final moment when the day an episode of, that you've written starts to shoot and John comes in with the completion of the ritual or he walks up, has the eraser, tosses it your way. For a second you can't remember and then you go, oh yeah, my episode started shooting today. You walk to the board, anybody who's worked on the John Wells show knows this, you go to your episode, you start erasing all of the items under there that people wrote up all the, as the episode was coming together. Usually the whole staff starts reading them aloud to you as you erase them, verifying that you really did that. That really got accomplished, that was in the episode, you did write that part of it. By the time you finished, the column is empty, the number's erased, the line is not erased, because now it's time to write 13, 14, 15, 16. And that's one of the greatest things about John is that underneath this ritual is an optimism that there's a future and you're gonna be able to handle it. And that you're really, you're not hanging on anything. It's ephemeral, it's going away, but the next one's right behind it. And um, I just hope that this method will become more widely used by all writers in all shows, it would make everybody a lot happier as writers because your work would be, you would have the kind of privilege that I've had where your own work gets respected because you got a leader at the, at the helm who is keeping things moving smoothly. So it's been a privilege. Thank you very much. May this be true. Is this to her? Yes. I'm, I'm glad she explained that because <laughs> <laughs> when he, he let me first write an episode, it was very quick, and he, and he said, well, if you want to write it, you gotta, you know, you got to write it fast, and I was starting to hyperventilate. I'd never written anything. Oh, God, I have this, you know, this embryonic idea, and John's going to let me write it, and, and he's like, don't worry, we'll, we'll go to the board. <laughs> And I didn't know what he meant, and he and he took me calmly into the room, and he and and he said, "You got to make sure you have you have different colors." <laughs> <laughs> and I went from like the, uh, admiration to thinking he's a crazy man with a with a <laughs> glorified crayon. I, um, uh, David Zabel. No. Oh, oh, Lydia, you're up. I got the wrong order. <laughs> sorry, Lydia. Only because I'm sorry, David, but they told me, and I'm just trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to follow my instructions here, and you know, the, when the guild asked us to do this, I they sent us these emails and such, and I really didn't understand because writers really don't follow instructions very well or read very well. Um, and so well, one thing I do is I, I'm working on a show now, and I'm actually working on uh, a show with a couple of writers who worked with John um, about 15 years ago. And I talked to them today, and I said, geez, I don't, what, what should I ask? And they said, ask questions. What am I supposed to ask him? And they, they had a question. They actually wanted me to ask you, they worked with you 15 years ago, and you've never hired them again. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think you know who they are, and you, uh, you might want to get back to them separately on that. Um, and, you know, I had actually quite a lot to say, but, uh, you know, as you know, Carol Flint, and maybe some of you in the room know, um, Carol Flint and I go way back with John to China Beach days. That's many, many years ago now. And Carol and I have always had the uh, 
good luck of being completely confused for each other our entire careers, mm -hmm. um, even though she was gray long before I was. Um, <laughs> or or let's, let's say she accepted it longer than long mm -hmm. before I did. Uh, I mean, we used to go to each other's meetings and people really didn't even know. Um, and it worked for a long time and so kind of keeping that, you know, completely indistinguishable from each other theme in our lives, we drove over from where we both live in Santa Monica together tonight and in the car, she says to me, she says, well, I, I need a lot of time. I, she says, I've got a long bit to do. I said, well, what, what do you mean you've got a long bit? I, don't have, I have nothing. She says, well, good, I need a lot of time. And she was very, very pushy about the whole thing. And I, I thought, Jesus, she has been this way since 1988. And, you know, in the room, John was always able to kind of clamp down and keep some control and stuff like that. And, and you know, despite a good friendship, I mean, I just felt... I don't know what to do. So anyway, I was going to ask a really long, really, really interesting question about profit participation. <laughs> uh, but um, um, because I, you know, being the generous friend I am, I gave my time to Carol. Um, <laughs> So I just, ha I just have one quick question. I, I think the audience, because I, I, I see the purpose here tonight is to kind of ask questions of you, John, to allow you to kind of, you know, tell people how you have done what you've done so successfully. And, you know, a big part of what we do is writing and a big part of really what you've done is manage and just manage incredibly well. And uh, that's managing writers and directors and, of course, you know, perhaps the most wonderful yet mercurial of our, of our family are, are the actors. So I guess specifically, when Robin Gibbons and Pam Gidley got into a fist fight on the set of Angel Street, can you speak specifically to what you did at the moment and on down the road? Well, the first thing you want to do is to hire a director who is as large as Rod Holcomb. <laughs> For any of you who know Rod, he is 6'6", uh, six, six, about 270, and his dad was a cop, and he's always armed. <laughs> um, but Rod backed up and um, sort of went like this, <laughs> like that to me, to, st <laughs> to, to step in. Um, you know, Pam had, has quite a hook, uh, <laughs> and I caught it sort of right here in the shoulder and made a, a kind of a girly noise, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it so shocked both of them <laughs> that they kind of stopped. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, I, I actually, um, I trace much of my training in life as an executive producer to those delightful five <laughs> months on Angel Street. Um, <clears throat> that was really, I wish that that was the, mo the strangest thing that happened. <laughs> on Angel Street between the two of them. I had to make a phone call. You, you probably remember this. Little. I had to make a phone call to, um, to Pam to please write, bef right after the director's called action and right before Robin starts acting on her close-up, please do not off-camera say, you're a crazy bitch. <laughs> 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 that... Um, that that was probably slowing production down a little bit and, <laughs> and a little counterproductive. Um, the, <laughs> the only stranger thing that I've had to deal with in my career is that I didn't really realize that I needed to tell people not to have major cosmetic surgery two to three days before the beginning of principal <laughs> photography. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's, that happened a little more recently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just when you think you've done it all, you know, you, you kind of go into the summer and you say, please don't cut your hair, please don't, you know, gain a lot of weight or lose a lot of weight, and mm -hmm. please don't have a major facelift. <laughs> <laughs> it has now been added to my list. <laughs> Neil Bear. Oh, God, he has audiovisual aids. So I, I prepared. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to say that I've had the great privilege of being friends with John Markham Wells for 42 years. 
when he arrived in the outskirts of Denver from the hollers of West Virginia. <laughs> he was a shy boy. I recall his first day in Mrs. Ross's class. He was wearing overalls and a straw hat. <laughs> we swapped stories at recess. I was a grade ahead. He was in my sister's class. He told me he had to, had to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to milk his cow, Bernice, and he even had to churn butter for his family's breakfast because his little brother, Lou, loved fresh butter on his mom's homemade biscuits. <laughs> John taught me a lot from the first days I knew him. How to chew tobacco, hunt for skunks, and to skin rabbits. He was so entrepreneurial back then that he even sold the rabbit's feet for good luck charms. I still have mine. <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg a little bit about John's upbringing because John and I grew up in a rather dull, treeless area of Denver called Holly Hills. There was no holly, there were no hills. <laughs> <laughs> just a lot of dirt. <laughs> we have known each other for over four decades, and even back then, John showed signs of his deep and unabiding love for storytelling and entertainment. He performed in a barbershop quartet with a kid named Harold, and they, were, and they wore outlandish red and white striped coats and sang horribly off-key. By high school, he was ensconced in theater. He didn't perform much, but he was always the stage manager. I have very fond memories of seeing John sweeping the sawdust off the stage. <laughs> and here's John in high school. He's very, he's very pixelated, um, more than he ever is in real life here. When he was a senior in high school, the acting yeah. <laughs> Do you know it's coming? For some reason in the play, an old woman beats the lion with an umbrella. John hated that and kept ducking on stage. But worse, he lost his tail when the character pulled it too hard, ripping it right off his ass along with part of the costume covering the aforementioned anatomy. <laughs> Here's what John said after that thespian experience. Quote, I really am not an actor. <laughs> this part's been done before, I, and I still couldn't do it right. <laughs> but the theater was in John's blood. He went to the prestigious Carnegie Mellon University. He was passionate. Th theater was evanescent. It was only to be absorbed in the intimate moment the actors shared with the audience. The work is all that I can be judged by. <laughs> and since it lives only as long as the resonance of the actor's breathy speech, <laughs> It is just forgotten as the energy of that actor's voice dissipates into the stillness of the theater's ambiance. <laughs> but that wasn't enough for John. He needed something that would last, that would stand the test of time. This is what he wrote to a dear friend. I quote, all I know is that I have to write. It's the only way I can tell you what I need to tell you without feeling like I'm going to explode. <laughs> Fortunately, he placed his volatile energies into writing and ended up on the hit show, China Beach. I ran into John at a grocery store back then and told him I had graduated from AFI as a directing fellow, but had started to write. He took me to lunch and said, my, uh, and said uh, that my former writing partner and I could meet with the China Beach, Beach folks, that's where I met Lydia and Carol, and we could pitch a story. I never even pitched it. I hadn't even written a TV script. So I know nothing about writing spec scripts. I tell young writers to grow up with someone like John Wells. <laughs> he hired me. I wrote my first script, and then I left for medical school. But John lured me back with an offer to come break stories on ER for a couple of months. And I stayed seven years and learned more than I imagined possible. John is truly the best producer in television and the best teacher. He takes the staff writers on up to casting, editing, producing. He teaches about every element of the story making process and the production process. And he only settles for excellence. He's the best editor I've ever worked with, and he's a consummate storyteller. He always taught me, take people on a journey. Make them be a little surprised. Show the unexpected, but make sure that the unexpected makes complete sense and is satisfying. So I'm just so grateful to him, and it's great to uh, be here uh, 
tonight to uh, share with you that even in the earliest days of Holly Hills and Trey Creek High School in Denver, Colorado, and living in the sticks as we did, that it somehow could produce someone of his great stature. Thank you. Great job, man. I would just like to point out that no one in this room really wants to have letters that they wrote when they were 19 years old <laughs> read aloud to hundreds of people. I would just like to suggest. I'm just really creeped out. I'm just. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> uh, writer uh, from the West Wing, Eli Addy. Hey. I definitely can't follow Neil, uh, um, but I can say that I was one of the writers on the West Wing banned from writing on John's dry erase board. So, so <laughs> you know, the, the, the three years that I was in the writer's room almost every day with John, if I did make a useful point in the writer's room, I actu actually had to wait for him to make eye contact with someone else so that they could write it on the board. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I, st I still have notes that you gave me <laughs> on my script. I don't know what the hell them. they mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and I will be very brief. When I was asked to say a couple words here, I, you know, I thought I would start off with some kind of outrageous anecdote about John. And, and as other people have, I think, uh, uh, suggested, there really aren't any. Uh, uh, especially Neil may have a few, and I know that John was a roadie at one point for touring rock bands earlier in his life. So I think these anecdotes exist. So I'm offering a cash prize if anybody <laughs> has anything I can use in the next minute and a half. But, but, um, but it's true that, that as somebody who started on the West Wing as a staff writer and worked under John for five years till the end of the show, uh, he's, you couldn't ask for, it's, it's kind of miraculous. John has this ability uh, um, that I wish more real politicians had to, to, to lead a group of people and to lead a room without dominating it. So sometimes it, it's, it's almost hard to know what his role was in a discussion, but he's completely steered you to the, to the point that you need to, to get to. So I'm just really grateful for the experience of, of working with John and learning from John. And, and I will ask a, a serious question, uh, uh, because it's something that really consumed the last season of The West Wing. The, the general part of the question is, since, you know, as the person who, who created ER and co-created The West Wing, how do you balance entertainment with I guess the soapbox, the opportunity to make a serious substantive point, and, and the more specific version of that is, is if you want to talk about any of the behind the scenes uh, jockeying and palm greasing that went into choosing the fake president in the final season of The West Wing. <laughs> um, you know, Aaron has this wonderful saying that, that, I think, um, that I think you want to be careful about any time you're trying to do something where you're also trying to make some points or get your opinion across is you don't want to make people feel as if they have to eat their vegetables. And so we're, we're inter we are involved in entertainment. People are very prepared, I think, to listen to more complicated issues and, and uh, points of view, moral and ethical conversations. But they also want to be entertained. And, and entertained doesn't mean that you only have to laugh. But you have to have some sense of uh, feeling an emotion through the course of that episode, um, whether that be uh, it makes you want to cry, it makes you want to laugh, it makes you want to do both if you're doing it right. And it's, the, the problem always, in, and it was particularly acute on, on West Wing, is that with so much going on in the world that you desperately wanted to say something about, was restraining yourself to tell stories about the characters. Because the, the audience is there for the characters and finding ways to do it within that. Because the, the thing I miss the most about not being in the West Wing room anymore is that the first hour of every West Wing writers' meeting was just a political discussion. <laughs> and we had the cover of that's what the show was about, so we pretended as if we were actually doing something that was useful for the business that we were, co <laughs> but we actually were just uh, swapping stories. Um, oh, oh, just, oh. Uh, you don't have to address this. Okay. Oh, you know, um, we, the intention was for, for uh, Venick to win, for Alan Alda's character to win. We actually had that story worked out. And, um, and that changed on December 16th when Stockard called and John had died. And then we spent the better part of a month trying to figure out whether we thought we could deal with the death of, uh, of Leo on the show and then also 
give our audience a Republican president. I, I, uh, <laughs> ultimately came to the conclusion that that might just be a little much. Um, uh, I think actually in retrospect, I wish we'd gone ahead and done it in some ways. Huh. Because Alan is such an extraordinary actor and what he brought to it was a humanity that I think probably people would have forgiven us for. But um, that was, I think, for all of us, a very difficult period. Uh, the, all of us had to go through it twice is really what happened. Uh, John died very you know, suddenly and surprisingly and we all sort of had to deal with that as a, as a group of people who knew him and cared about him and loved him and, and were going to miss him. And then we had to write about the character and f sort of four to six weeks later go through it a whole second time in the show itself. The writing of it, the prepping of it, then the directing, the acting and editing of it. So it was, uh, it, it's pretty much everything that grief counselors tell you not to do, <laughs> which is to stay in that for a very long period of time. And I was proud of everybody that we were working with that, uh, at, at those episodes of what we were able to do. That was very, uh, son? It was very weird to be, you know, a pallbearer at John's funeral and then be a pallbearer at Leo's funeral a month later. It was very strange. Um, and on that hilarious note. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, who do we have? Uh, David Zaber. David. David yeah. 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 Top that. <laughs> I was deliberately unfunny. Oh, wow. Brad, thanks for helping me out tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been sitting out there listening to these stories and thinking how funny and touching they all were, and, and my predominant sentiment has been, I am screwed. <laughs> um, because I, I was supposed to, I, I, in my mind, I should have gone when Lydia went, because I had a great Robin Givens story, and now I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a picture of John as a baby, and I can't do that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, as evidence of, of how well I have learned from John Wells, I, I got a call from the WGA asking me if I would be part of this evening. And I, I said I, I was very honored. I would be pleased to do it. I'd be thrilled to do it. I'd be honored to do it. And I, I, I had a lot in mind that I would like to talk about. And I hung up the phone and I immediately called a writer's meeting. <laughs> 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 and I said, all right, guys, what am I going to say at this John Wells thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> They're a good group, but they didn't help me at all, actually. Uh, um, I was thinking uh, uh, of a story from a few years ago on ER when I wanted to do a scene. Uh, it, it, it actually, I'm latching on to what John said about nobody's wrong in the writer's room. And I was thinking of a story. I, I wanted to do a scene that it was at a funeral of a character, and I wanted uh, another character to be drunk and to act up at this funeral in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate way and ultimately to possibly fall in the in the grave. And, <laughs> and John, John, was, John said, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if that's the show, David. <laughs> and I was like, it is, John, it is. It, it can be the show, John. <laughs> it will be the show. Um, and, and John was like, I, I don't know, I don't know. And, and some of the other writers, because they just like to stoke me, they were like, yeah, David, you should let the guy fall in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, come on, John, let, let me do that, let me do that. And John, in, 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 his, in his democratic way, you know, ultimately gave way and let me do that scene, that, that, that comic moment, which in the end was truly dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> really a mistake, a big mistake. Um, it was such a big mistake that I thought, okay, the show's going to be canceled in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Fortunately, that was about four years ago, so we survived. The point of the story really is that John, the way he dresses the, the, the running of a show and the writer's room is, is, is he really does listen and you can actually win a fight even when you should lose the fight. <laughs> um, but, but out of that attitude comes a lot of positive effects. A lot of, a lot of great things happen because, because there is a democracy there and there is a way to sort of, he, he creates an atmosphere in which your voice can really be heard and, 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 and what you want to express or what you want to do ends up on the page and on the screen and that has a, great, a lot of great results, sometimes some mistakes, uh, but we've, we've survived. And, uh, and one other quick anecdote that's sort of, sort of parenthetically in the same vein is uh, John, I've been on the show six years and John a few years ago said to me, uh, 
uh, David, uh, you know, maybe I think uh, I'd like you to, to run the show because he was doing many different things and he wanted me to run the writer's room. And, and, and I said, John, you know, I love the show and I'm really excited about it. This was season 10, I think, uh, season 11. And I said, but I am concerned about being uh, the captain of the Titanic here. <laughs> and, and John said, don't worry, David, we have lots of lifeboats. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's season 13, we're going in, we start season 14 tomorrow, so it's worked out, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Tom Hansen here? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. gets no round of applause, so. Let's try that again. Tom Hansen. Tom Hansen. Thank you. Um, I sort of wondered what I was doing here. I've been John's lawyer, of all things, for the last 20 years, and I had a very important question, but this is great. It's been answered, because over those 20 years, I've always wondered what John actually does when we're not negotiating a new deal at Warner's. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's fantastic. Um, I knew that John was a, when I first met John, young guy, uh, referred to me, it was great, and his main business at that point with his mom was they were the leading slumlords of Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and uh, they had about, I think his mom would tell us, they had 35 houses or something like that, and they were rented out on a regular basis, and John's mother, who was kind of petite, but she'd go over there and really throw a family of stevedores out of it. It was really pretty interesting. So I had several criminal beefs that I had to do for John's mom. Assault uh, it was pretty fantastic. Um, you know, uh, one of the other things that happened during that uh, era is I did get a call from uh, John's agent at that time, who is a guy named Jeff Sanford, a lot of you may know, who is one of the most erudite, well-read. He did very little agenting because I think he was getting his PhD in philosophy when he was representing you. And he said, there's this young guy it's probably 1986, and he's been doing some work for television. He's written a couple of, uh, of scripts for, I think, Moonlighting was when we first met each other. And, you know, he's produced a, a, been a producer of an independent movie. And I said, what's the name of it? He said, it's a very, very important foreign film. It's called Chica Explosivo. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely fantastic. I went to film school, and I had a really high opinion of myself and the people I would represent. And it, Felt like it would be in the, you know, of like Louis Bunuel during his Mexican period of Los Alvidados, that it would be <laughs> similar to that. And, you know, uh, we met for the first time, I think we had at Jaime's Fish Market, which was where every poor lawyer and poor uh, writer went uh, in those days, and we had a great conversation and tried to find out, and I kept asking him about this movie, and he was very, very coy about it, and we let it go and pretty much moved on to... Uh, making our first deal at Warner's, which I think was in 42. Was that when it was? <laughs> and it, it, it's sort of interesting because w I thought about it when we were coming over here, uh, having started with Alan Shane, and then I think we went to Harvey Shepard, and I think we went to Les Moonves, and then it was Tony Jonas, and we've had Peter Roth since then. And the first deal we did, and I want to, you, you very seldom hear great things said about a TV business affairs guy, but we did it with a wonderful man named Mark Stolnitz who just passed away and who was one of the gentlemen. Um, and here was this young guy. Oh, we, didn't we have Scott, uh, Scott, uh, we had somebody else in there too. We, we, <laughs> ran, we ran him out of town too. Um, the most important thing generally with John was getting a big room. And I used to go over there and have lunch with him occasionally. And, you know, thank you, Carol, for describing that board thing. Because I went in there and this was in the fourth or fifth year of, uh, of ER, and the money was starting to come in pretty good, and I said, that's fantastic. John's finally been able to buy a Jackson Pollock. It was <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this has really been a great event for me. Um, one of the things that John and I really often joke about, he jokes about it, I don't, is that I like to occasionally take a vacation. It's a rare thing. And for some reason, John always finds something to really drive me insane about during my vacation. He's a great client, he's reasonable, he's rational, but it seems like every Christmas he wants to give away huge amounts of money. And for some reason, I don't know why that is, it's difficult. Uh, and it always happens during my vacation, but it's been pretty good. Um, John 
probably a lot of you don't know this, is, is now, among other things, the Donald Trump of the North Shore of Kauai. Um, <laughs> he has several large ranchos. He's developing a beachfront casino. And the last thing I did for John, actually, was I supervised, done two things. I supervised the building contract, because I think you're building a swine unit, you, because there's a big demand for that. And the other thing we did is um, we had to work out the, I think, the 30-year pension plan for your real estate maven in Hawaii. So it's, it's been a thrill representing John. And again, I'm so delighted to find out what he actually does. I mean, it, it's great. And if you have, Carol, I, I mean, uh, Lydia, that question about the net profit thing, yeah. I try not to really bother John with that too much, but if you want to, then fine. Uh, you know, all joking aside, we've been together for 22 years. And, and the real question was going to be, I was going to actually ask John if this, in fact, was an accurate uh, piece of paper and maybe you could pass that oh, down uh, to him. Yeah. And uh, this explains that after all those years of me believing that John was involved with the production of uh, a Boonwell classic, it's something a little bit different. We probably won't. Yeah, nice girls don't explode. Uh, <laughs> it was for New World in uh, 1984. Yeah, and I, and I, yeah. And I want to say that even then, John was already thinking about in, in his role as, and I have to say, one of the great moments of all of our lives when I think you had three shows on the air. I think we're in the middle of this ridiculous deal, and John said, you know, I think I'm going to run for president of the Writers Guild. <laughs> and everybody in his sort of life sort of went, oh, uh, okay. Um, all joking aside, it's been a fantastic time. Everything uh, people say about John as a, as a writer and a person is absolutely the same in my experience. We've had a great time together. I think one of the things John does in terms of my terrible job, and, and by the way, I don't get a chair. I have to go back and sit in the audience because <laughs> I don't pay dues to any guild. And, uh, <laughs> is the kind of respect and nurturing. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from John, both about being a professional in this business and being a human being. It's been great to grow up with you. It's been great to see you as a father, as a friend. It's a real honor to have you as my friend. And uh, I'll think of some more questions soon. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
it, it took about five and a half years to negotiate. It was an idea of, of uh, Nick Kazans, who's sitting here in the audience with us. And uh, when I was president of the Guild, we started talking about it in the context of a lot of the creative uh, rights meetings that we were having, that uh, why couldn't we actually just get the companies to give us the things that we wanted? Why, why weren't writers getting gross compensation? Um, why weren't writers uh, getting some of the creative rights things that we were very anxious to try and get and, and understanding that writers participating in the process would actually be a plus. And we went and met with a number of different um, CEOs of the companies and some of the business affairs exe executives and just asked them the question. And their, their response was that, um, that for many of the writers that they're using in the development process, the costs are so high, uh, they're spending a great deal of money for it that the um, that they felt since they were taking all the risk and a lot of those scripts don't get made, that they had the right to do with it, with it whatever they wanted to do. Uh, that if they were putting that much money in it up front. And, uh, you know, the, so we kind of went back and thought about it and said, well, maybe we should try to, to, uh, to call their bluff and see if we can smoke them out a little bit and, and said, you know, if we come back in and get a group of screenwriters uh, to, to take some kind of a risk on their upfront costs, would you, would, the studios be interested in, in uh, you know, cutting us into the back end and, and in a significant way, in a gross participation way, and in giving some additional creative rights. And I think a little bit to our surprise, the response was yes. Now, that yes happened, and we were all excited, and we went out into the courtyard at Warner Brothers and said, whoopee, and that was 2002, Nick, or something, you know. <laughs> um, and then we actually got into the process, uh, and Tom Hansen's very involved in that process, and Ed Haspel was down front uh, over a on and off again period of, you know, basically five years because every single issue was precedential and how are we going to deal with it. So I think, uh, I think that we believe that the, that the business is changing in a way in which um, everyone's going to have to get a lot more entrepreneurial and that as fees start to come down and as um, we're required to get more entrepreneurial, we better get something for it because otherwise what's going to happen is just uh, fees are, and quotes are beginning to get, uh, I think most people who write in screen are feeling that pressure already. It's certainly happening in, um, also happening in television for episodic rates. There's a lot of pre downward pressure on that. And in exchange for that, we're trying to set some floors for if you're going to take more chance on yourself, that you receive a real gross participation, which is a, which is a first dollar gross participation. You receive the right not to be rewritten without your permission. Um, the right to participate throughout the creative process. Um, and if the movie's made, you're made whole on all of your fees because you've taken risk. And what was interesting though is even though the specifics of it took a very long time to work out, the principle of it was embraced relatively quickly and particularly by the business affairs executives who feel we're go they're going to get roughly 20 scripts uh, for the price of two. Um, and they're willing to give a great deal if we're willing to take some risk. And just as writers, as a group, I think we're going to be doing a lot more of that in the future. I think that's really the direction that the, that the business is headed in. And we, we weren't trying to be, uh, our thinking wasn't that advanced at the time. We were just trying to get a couple of things. And the business has actually kind of caught up with us over the period of time that we negotiated it. But, it, but for anybody who's interested in the deal, um, because of the way the deal was structured, we had to present Warner Brothers <clears throat> a number of years ago with a group of writers who would agree to do it, even though there really wasn't a deal yet. So we went to people that we knew personally and that we had knew that were sort of like-minded and, and, and Nick and Tom uh, Shulman worked very hard to gather a, a group who could do that and said they wouldn't discuss it outside of uh, their conversations with Tom and Nick. And so the, the group became sort of self-selecting by who we knew already sort of shared in our same uh, goals. Uh, but the deal itself is available for anybody who wants to see it. And, and we're very hopeful that people will actually take that template and start to use it. It's not something that we feel proprietary about. We're, we're hoping that, it, uh, that, that other people use it. And I've heard that there are some peop other people who already are using it. So let's uh, keep your fingers crossed. We really hope it works. The worst day of my life, you mean? Yeah. I remember the read through. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone heard the first thing. Oh, yeah. The oh, oh, this is I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> you 
can you can answer. It. I'm still I'm still here, right? Uh, no, the, uh, the the question was how did John feel when uh, when Aaron uh, left, um, and there were certain plot tangles to be um, untied, and I just remember <laughs> that John John came in and and, and uh, uh, typically uh, this was a difficult task. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the read-through, he, he put the script down, and he, he said he felt like Ethel Merman's understudy. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> um, but, uh, but I don't know how, <laughs> how you felt. <laughs> Truly. I remember uh, I had seen the episode many times during the editorial process of the final episode that Aaron had written. And Marilyn and I were in Hawaii on vacation, and we watched it on the air. And I remember finishing it and looking to my wife and saying, oh, my God, I'm really fucked. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was um, <clears throat> I think we, we met, actually. The, 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 uh, the cast got together when, when that happened. It happened sort of in April. Uh, that that Aaron made that decision and and that Tommy uh, had said we did sort of know Tommy was sort of known he had kind of been trying to ease himself out for a full year so that wasn't as much of a surprise and we were a little more a little more prepared to to replace Tommy uh, Shlami in the mix um, but uh, we all got together as a group and we had a real conversation about whether or not we wanted to continue to try to continue because I um, Aaron's an extraordinarily talented writer, has a very unique voice that was completely and wholly identified with the show. And, and I had been around enough that I wasn't fool enough to, foolish enough to think that we were going to be able to put a writing staff together from <clears throat> and immediately do well with living up to the kind of the level, the quality of what the show had been. We knew it was going to be a task. And we had a, v a very serious conversation as a group, you know, because everybody was going to have to pull together and do it. And, and the, the argument that I kind of came around to and ended up making was that the world that we were in at the time, and that I would argue we're still in, and I, it's the reason why I wish we were still able to, have, we had still been able to do the show in the last year, is that <clears throat> there weren't a lot of voices, particularly at that time, in opposition. And while we weren't specifically in opposition to what was happening in the country, we were by example trying to be in opposition to what was happening in the country. And we talked about even if we couldn't do it as well, was that a something that we should be doing, a, a cause that was worth continuing to do? And uh, I foolishly thought it was at the moment. <laughs> and then it was really the hardest thing in my writing career that I've ever tried to do. And and you know, in all honesty, I thought in the first year we uh, that we, which was year five, I thought we that was very rocky. We had some good times and some not so good times, not individually, but just creatively with what we were doing. And then we started to kind of find our own rhythm and, and had some very good episodes sort of tur towards the end of that mm -hmm. year and sort of all having fun mm -hmm. again. Yeah. And, but it was very difficult for everybody to think of how we would actually, you know, go on that way, mm -hmm. you know. And back, I wanted to sort of mention something about David's point about trying to talk people out of something, you know. Uh, one of the reasons I back off of it if I am pushing too hard is because I'm oftentimes wrong. I mean, I, I tell the story on myself of spending a couple of weeks trying to talk Aaron out of doing the scene in the cathedral, in Washington Cathedral, uh, where Martin takes on God, because I had tried to do that in China Beach and done a pretty bad job of it and was pretty convinced that nobody could do it, and, and um, was proven very wrong and, and, and used as an example as an executive producer that even if you're positive about something, if you're talking to a writer that you respect who strongly believes in something, even if you're certain they're wrong, it's important to allow them to do it because you, and uh, certainly in my case, I'm, I, w I have often been wrong about it. So it's a, you know, it's a quality that's important to kind of keep going. So Aaron pulled it off and David did not. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been thinking that for the last 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I think my guy falling in the grave was just as important as Martin <laughs> talking to God. <laughs> I'm sure it was probably a performance issue. Yes, it was. It was an execution problem, yeah, 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 not yeah. a writing problem. <laughs> um, we're, I believe, going to uh, uh, 
cease and desist in one second after we watch a mini clip of John's other hyphenate um, uh, right now. Oh my God. Are we going to have